So welcome to my talk, everyone. My name is Daniel Kronovitz. I'm going to be. I'm going to be talking about how to set up your development environments with a focus on IPython. But this talk is not entirely about IPython. It's about all of the fun things you're going to need to do about developing productively. Come on, there you go. So this is your development microcycle. Um, you make some sort of change in your code. You write a line, whatever it is. You install a package, and then you think it does something. Sometimes it does what you thought it did. Sometimes it does not do what you thought it did. You need to get feedback. You get feedback on the change you made, and you can make another change. This is how software gets written. Um, the problem is that this circle is filled with pain. Um, and the bigger the circle is, the more pain you will go through to write software. Which leads us to the next point, which is this cycle can be made smaller. Uh, there will be less pain and more fun. Um, and you'll enjoy your job, and you'll write better software, and things will be better for everyone. So there are four really important things that I learned when I was coming to the Python community uh, about developing productively. Um, I'm going to talk about all four of them. They are choosing an interpreter, understanding imports, which was a hassle for me for a while, knowing how to test, and then using the debugger. All very important tools to shorten your development microcycle. So the interpreter I like is IPython. I use it in the command line, which according to our keynote speaker makes me a hipster. Um, but I do. Um, and IPython is a great interpreter for a couple of reasons. I'm going to talk about four of them now. Uh, the first one is it allows you to have a number of very cool magic commands. These are commands you can type in the interpreter that do kind of special things that the normal Python interpreter cannot do. Um, one is run. Whatever comes after run will be run uh, as if you had done Python from the command line. Um, which is a useful way to run any kind of script from within your, your interpreter. The other is debug, which is super amazing. Um, if you ever run any code that throws an exception, type debug into your interpreter, you'll like, go back in time into, an, into a debugger right where the exception occurred. So you can go right back into the session, figure out what went wrong without running any tests or like, recreating the environment. You'll go right back into the environment. It's a huge time saver. Um, one is prun, which will profile your code. Anything that comes after prun will be run normally, and you'll get the uh, profiler statements if you were using C profile automatically. The last one is time it, um, which runs like time it does normally. It'll run your code a number of times and then tell you how long it took. Um, so these are all very convenient for getting feedback fast. Yeah. And so another thing that IPython is really good at is history. Um, it has some very powerful history features that the normal Python interpreter does not. Um, this happens, and then you have the underscore, which goes back one. The normal Python interpreter does have this. IPython does have double underscore, which goes back two, which is kind of neat. But the really cool thing is it has this. Every single thing that is, come, that is entered in or comes out of an interpreter session is accessible in a huge hash. You can access by doing out or in in a number. So anything that came out of your entire session, you can go back to at any point, which is very cool. So you don't have to recreate, do calculations again, because it's all been stored. All right. Another thing that is great is tab completion. Um, I'm going to give you an example later, which I'll show you exactly why this was amazing. But if you're ever exploring a new object that you don't really know what its attributes are, what its functions are, just type dot and tab, and you'll see everything that thing can do. Um, if you had no idea what it was, it's, it's really almost better than reading the docs. You can just see very quickly its entire capability. Um, in this case, the list example is very simple, but if you're coming into a new library using a new package that you don't really understand, this is a great way to figure out what you're dealing with. Um, and similarly, the question mark. You can type question mark after any method or object and see where it's defined and its entire doc string. Um, and I'm going to give you an example of where this was useful in my life. So I am the engineer at a health technology startup. I'm the main engineer. And I had to build a web application using this stack, um, Flask, which uses, or so I was using MongoDB. And then on top of MongoDB, there is a library called PyMongo, which is developed by the MongoDB folks, uh, which wraps MongoDB. And then Mongo Alchemy goes on top of MongoDB which is an ORM, and then Flask Mongo Alchemy goes on top of Mongo Alchemy, which is an extension that connects you to Flask, and then there's Flask, which is the micro framework. Um, so I had used zero of these things before, and to set up my database. And I really didn't know where one ended or the other began, um, and I was reading source code, and that was kind of fun, but then I realized that... Did you increase the um, I would love to. I could just use IPython. Sometimes it's a little slow. This computer is four years old. All right, so DB. And I'm trying to figure out here where these various objects are defined, from which package do they come from. So my database came 
from, you'll see here. Set packages. Uh, oh. Hold on. I realize that some of it's cut off. I will shrink this. Sorry. You got it? Right, you can see that this is coming from Flask Mongo Alchemy. Um, then I move up and I want to see what this thing has on it. It has a number of features. Um, one of them is Session. I take a look. And Session is now in Mongo Alchemy. So we've left Flask Mongo Alchemy. We're now in Mongo Alchemy. The source code for this object, which I need to understand, is found in Mongo Alchemy. This also means that its functionality is not part of the extension. I am now deep in Mongo Alchemy. Um, and Sam's so trying to figure out where the database itself is. So if the session is the connection between Flask Mongo Alchemy and Mongo Alchemy, then the connection to the database is probably in here somewhere. Another tab completion, and then I see over here there's database. What is that? That is, ah, so now we're in PyMongo. So this is the connection to my actual MongoDB database, db.db. This would have taken me much longer to find had I not had the tools of IPython. All right, moving forward. Uh, imports. Imports gave me a huge hassle when I first started using Python. I'm sure some of you struggle with it as well. Um, there are four ways to import. You can import a module. Uh, you can import a specific class defined in the module. You can import a module or any module uh, or a function within the module as some shortcut name. This happens a lot with pandas. Um, or you can import everything using the star, which is very bad because then you have no idea where things you're using are defined. Um, so this is generally a bad practice. Use one of the first three and your life will be a little bit better. All right. And so. You create a package by creating an init file, which tells Python to look inside of it for new modules. Um, and I'm going to show you kind of one of the quirks. Whereas inside init, you can leave init blank, or you can include imports within it. And the difference here is that if you import a package, you notice how we imported module A within the init file, which means that if we import the package and then try to call package.module and then a function foo, it'll work. However, if we try to do the same thing for the second module, bbaz, it does not work because importing the package by itself does not automatically import all the modules defined in it unless they're imported by the init file. I assume this is a kind of an efficiency thing because you're, if you're importing a large package, you don't need all the things in it. If you're importing math, for example, you don't need all the math if you're trying to square something. Um, so this is a Python efficiency thing, which is important to know. However, if we import the module directly explicitly in the interpreter, then we can call baz and it would work. So if something is defined in init, it'll import if you import the package by itself. Otherwise, you have to import it explicitly. All right. Now, something else. There's two ways to import. So this is something that also I didn't quite realize right away. But wherever you start your interpreter is your interpreter's perspective. Everything that is in the directory which you started the interpreter and downwards, the interpreter will know about. Anything that is above it, the interpreter will not know about. So you start here at the top level, and you'll know about everything, meaning you can import my package. And you'll see that the package is imported directly from the directory. There's no longer path here. It's not importing it from the root down. It's importing it from the, uh, the directory it was in, because it could just see it. It said, oh, my package is right here. I don't have to look anywhere else. However, if you were to go down one level and then import, um, you would get an error where it would not see my package, because um, it wouldn't see the package. However, if you were to import module A, it would work. Notice how, in this case, module A is being imported by itself, not my package module A, because from this level in the file system, it just sees module A and imports it. However, it does not see my package because it is here. It does not know of anything called my package. Um, the main solution to this, for, for example, if you install packages using pip, is to add something to your Python path. Your Python path is the system variable that Python look, uses to look for packages. So we're adding the path to my package, the Python path, which means setting the interpreter even here, we can import my package. Notice how in this case, it's not importing it from the file that I was in. It's actually importing it from the root of the file system because it couldn't see my package where, uh, in the directory where the interpreter was started. So it looked in the Python path, found it, and imported it. Um, and so just so you know, when you install a package, this is, this is how this works. There is a Python variable. And the Python path points to a file that's usually like this. Um, you install something, and it gets added to it. So this is like what's going on behind the scenes if you didn't know. Moving on, testing. Um, so this is the structure of a test file using the unit test framework. Um, 
you import unit test, you create a class that inherits from test case, you define a test, you make an assertion, if the assertion is true, the test passes, if the assertion is false, the test fails. Um, okay. There are a number of ways, oh, and so, I like using the PyTest framework over unit test by itself, because it has a number of features that, that I like, I'm not gonna go into all of them, um, but it's, it's kind of nicer. Um, and it works basically the same as unit test by itself um, in a lot of cases. There's a number of ways to use py.test. Um, you can run it directly, as I did here, and it'll run all the tests that it can find, again, looking downward from where you are. So wherever you start the interpreter, it'll look down, look for anything, any file that starts with test underscore, and then look for tests within that and run all those tests. Um, if you specify a specific test module, it'll run just the tests in that module. If you pass the dash x flag, it'll stop after the first failure. This is known as fail fast. This can be very useful if you're trying to develop something one test at a time. Instead of getting a bunch of failures, which can be overwhelming, you'll get one failure, you can deal with it, you get another failure, move on. Um, dash dash pdb is nice because if you get an exception, it'll automatically throw you into the interpreter versus having to uh, insert an import statement, import pdb, and do it, uh, or get into the interpreter another way. So that's a nice shortcut. And s, there's, inter there's um, uh, this is kind of tangential, but there's a uh, debugger called ipdb, which is a little bit fancier that I'm not gonna get into now. But if you're going to be using IPDB to debug instead of PDB, you'll need to put the dash S flag so it won't error. Um, all right, so testing principles. Testing, by the way, if you're not testing, you really should be because it will save you time and money over the long run, even if it seems like an investment in time up front. Um, tests are documentation and verification, both of what your code does and how it works. If you come to a new code base, they say the fastest way to figure out what actually you're working with is to read the test suite. So it'll tell you what the code is meant to do and how you interact with it. Um, tests are also meant to be isolated and complete, and that every test needs to be run separately from other tests, so that every test you can actually know is testing what you think it's testing. You don't want data from one test leaking into another, because then you might be getting tests passing when they should be failing. Um, and they should be complete, and then they should be testing every part of your application. Um, this is something that my programming teacher said once that I thought was really powerful. Um, we talk about test-driven development a lot. Um, and what he said was, well, you're not actually testing when you're writing tests, you're designing. By thinking through what your inputs are and your outputs are, what is a reasonable thing to expect, you can then design code um, that, that is really somewhat better. Once you think about the interactions, the code itself will flow much more naturally versus flipping it around, whereas you write the entire library or package or module, then try to figure out how to test it. You'll, you'll be, you'll be, it'll be harder to write the test for, ex for first thing um, and it'll probably be harder to use, uh, second thing. All right, um, there's two kinds of tests. So there's two philosophies of testing. One is macro testing, or rather micro testing, which is unit test, where you test every individual function or method that you write. Um, there's some pros to this. You make sure that you document everything very thoroughly. You know, everything works, it is slower. Um, and it is harder to change things, because if you're gonna change a function, you might have to change all of the tests. Uh, the second philosophy is macro testing, integration testing. With this one, you test the system at a higher level. You give one input over here, and instead of testing every input and output along the way, you test the final output. Um, the disadvantage is there's less coverage. The advantage, though, is that if you want to, for example, change internal implementation, you can do that without breaking the test. Um, some people think it's much better because you can change the way that the package is written as long as it keeps passing these macro tests, then you know that the thing is still working the way that it should. Um, but you can have your own opinions. It's kind of controversial. Um, there's a smart dilemma when it comes to writing tests. Um, you want them to be rigorous and that you want them to be independent um, and test everything about the code. You want them to be dry. You don't want to repeat a lot of setup stuff, um, boilerplate, and you want them to be fast that you don't have to be creating a bunch of variables that you don't need for every test. However, this isn't always possible because if you want them to be rigorous and dry, they're going to be slow because you're going to have these big setup functions where you'll just create like 10 or 20 different variables that you don't actually need for the test, but you only have to write them once because setup functions are run before every single test. Um, uh, if you want them to be rigorous but fast, they're not going to be dry because every single test you'll have to write exactly the things you need for that one test and not the others, which means the test will run faster, but you're going to have to write a lot of code for every test. And third is you can have them dry and fast where you just write a bunch of setup code once. Or This is actually, um, you have one big test with a bunch of assertions um, which saves you from having to recreate certain objects before every test, but um, there's a high chance that you're going to be having data that you didn't quite expect would be there, especially if you're testing a database. Um, so this is something that you get to struggle with. And the last thing is learning the debugger. 
Um, there's two ways to enter the debugger. The first is to, so PDB is the um, kind of vanilla Python debugging tool. Uh, the way that you run, you get into it is in your code you import PDB, uh, semicolon PDB set trace, and whenever that line is hit, you will jump into the debugger. Um, and I'll talk about what happens when you're in the debugger in a bit. Um, the second way to do it is, as I said before, you run PyTest with the dash dash PDB flag. And if you ever get an exception, you will jump into the uh, debugger. Uh, the debugger has a couple of commands that you should know about. Um, when you're debugging, you're at a level of a function, but there are functions that came before. And if you've gone up, there's functions that came after. So up and down will let you ascend or descend the levels of the function to get to where you want to be. Uh, when you're at the right level, next, n, will let you get to the next line. So not go down into a function call, but rather skip the function call, go to the next line. And then s will let you step into a function call, which means you go down a level into whatever function is about to come up. L will let you see what's around, so you kind of know where you are in the function. C and B will let you set arbitrary breakpoints and just like skip to them, so you don't have to press N a bunch of times. And we will quit the debugger. Um, all right, so let's put it all together and show how we test a, a function. So in my module B, we have a function square. It has a bug in it. Maybe you'll be able to find it. If you do, don't say. Um, and we're going to test it. Import unit test, import square. We're going to test it. We expect score 10 to be 100. That's sensible. We run PyTest, the first test module A passes, second one fails. The assertion error is the number is way bigger than we thought it would be, and we're not really sure why. So we throw import PDB into the test, run the test again, and then we're in the debugger. So this is the line. Notice how we put the debugger here, which means the first thing that we get once we enter the debugger is this. And we think that this is the function we're testing, this is probably where it's going to be, or where the bug will be, so we step into it. And we're here. It tells us that we just call the function where the function is defined, the first line of the function, but we don't really have much context. So we see that we're there at the beginning of a function. Now what we're trying to do when we're debugging is be very scientific. We have to figure out at what point the incorrect value was set to our function. Once we figure out exactly when the first bad value appeared, with more precision, what has gone wrong. All right. So let's see what ANS is at this point. It's undefined, which means that it's anything before this could not have been wrong because there's the ANS is not defined. There's no bad value here, so it had to come after this point. Okay, so now we see ANS, and it's the big number. So we know that whatever had gone wrong happened exactly at this point, point. and also we know what went wrong because we know exactly where the bug occurred. So we go back to our function, fix the bug, run the tests, all is well. Um, yeah, and that's kind of the workflow. Um, yeah, and so I guess that actually was it. Um, a little faster than I thought. Um, yeah, so anyway, that's, yeah, all right. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so this is the, um, yeah, this is the cycle by which you make changes, get feedback quickly, make changes, get feedback quickly to have um, a productive development experience. So I guess we do have some time for questions. Um, if there any people want, yes. I'm just curious, were you using the uh, Google Drive integration with iPython for that, or for this? Yeah. No, I just wrote all that. Oh, you just wrote the story. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> By the way, the color coding is um the uh, what's it called? The solarized theme, which is um it's a, I have it on my Sublime text. It's a it's a color scheme which has been scientifically designed so that every color contrasts using color theory. It's actually really pleasant to look at. It's really nice. Solarized. You should check it out. But yeah, I just made this slide. Uh, yep. Yeah. Can you just go into the difference between uh, PDB and IPDB? Sure. So IPDB is an interactive debugger. Um, it lets you do things like tab completion, um, which you can do in normal IPython, um, and has a couple of other features like that. Um, it's, just in a, it's an additional thing to install, which is why I didn't cover it in this demonstration. But I would recommend using it. Just know that PyTest will suppress all standard output which means that it'll throw a bug if you use IPDB unless you pass the, da the, das the dash S flag, which will allow um, standard output. Yes? Do you have any favorite things in like, iPad like config that you discovered? That you yes. So the first thing that happened um, was I would make changes to my source code, and then they would not be reflected in IPython. I would get very upset. And I spent a lot of time just like, shutting down IPython, starting up IPython, shutting it down. And then I realized that I just needed to um, enable recursive auto-reload, and disable creation of pick files. And then things worked much better. I've had 
Pick files and underscore underscore pycache underscore underscore directories have added nothing but heartache to my life. Um, so yeah, disabling creation of pick files is important and enabling auto reload is important because then whatever is loaded in that Python will be more accurate representation of your actual source code. Yes? Um, I've had a lot of trouble over the years with the changing implementations of auto reload and manual deep reload. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you can, in some detail, explain <sighs> how or whether these actually work because there are some modules that seem to break when you reload them by any means. I, um, the, the depth of my, of my understanding of this issue is, is not as deep as I'd like it to be. Um, my, my, my understanding is that if you have auto reload set up or cursor auto reload set up, if you reload a module, it'll reload every module that that module depends on. Um, in specific cases of it not working, I, I really can't say. I wish I could. Could you show how you exactly configure your configuration file? Oh. What the actual syntax you're using? Let me pull that up for you if I can remember where it is. Um, Actually, would it be okay if I found it after? Because I, I don't remember where it is, but I will, I will follow up with you, sir. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, you, you mentioned the, the one command that lets you run things that uh, Python files that exist. Is there, do you know of any way uh, to send Python code that you created in, the, in, in IPython from uh, that interpreter and sending that to a, a text editor? Um, I mean, I guess you could probably access some kind of... Um, like output IO function and write it to a text file. Um, but I don't have any magic commands that allow you to do that. You mean just like using history and copy and pasting? That's what I, I I meant not using history and copy and pasting. <laughs> 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 not doing yeah. that. But, yeah. 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 Um, that. That was the other solution that I have. But I was wondering about more, more general. Um, uh, something, something more general than using that. Does anyone know? Okay. Um, one thing that I will add is if efficiency of um, minimizing the amount of typing you have to do between every feedback cycle is really important. I found that the fastest way, for this example, I put the debugger in the test file. It goes through the process of stepping and entering functions. But when I'm actually developing, um, putting it right in the source code is usually the fastest way. Um, I guess the thing I like to say is minimizing the amount of thoughts you have to think and keys you have to prep during your feedback loop is really the way to go. Um, yeah, so that's usually the fastest place. Just put it in your source code. Um, it's, it's faster to copy and paste the import command where you need it than actually step through and set breakpoints. I do that never. Um, so yeah, one of the first things in my command history is um, that import line. And whenever there's a bug, I just like put it somewhere, put it somewhere else, um, run the test. I will say, if you're not testing, it's, it's really a great idea just because it saves you all the trouble in your testing environment. Once you write the test that sets up your environment, you can recreate it immediately. If you're just launching an interpreter and like running, like importing things and like defining variables and testing them, you're, you're really wasting a lot of time. You would do that once, create the test for it, and run the test and you're exactly where you want to be. Um, so uh, it's really fast um, once you have the test written, if, if any of you aren't testing. Um, yeah. Other questions? Yes. I guess I'm wondering how you uh, integrate Python into your workflow because what you've been showing us seems like a lot of sort time. of interactive interpreter mode with some history that you can copy paste to your like, text editor. Right. So, um, so for my company, the health tech company, I wrote a data analysis library uh, which uses pandas very heavily. Um, I never used pandas before, and so I used IPython, IPython very heavily during the initial kind of planning of the library learning what Panda's methods were, exploring the data, um, figuring out what needed to exist in the library. And then once I had a plan for how to approach writing the library, it was much more writing the tests, writing the modules, writing the tests, writing the modules. Um, I found myself actually in the interpreter much less uh, when I was developing the library and writing the source code. Then it was much more test, module, test, module. But for exploration, um, IPython was really indispensable. Um, I think I'm almost out of time. Maybe one last thing. We're done. Thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure.